Ghana's rising debt stock is not going to take a nose dive anytime soon, as the International Monetary Fund expects it to hit about 300 billion Ghana cities before the end of 2021. Now, my colleague Amos Ekokofi spoke to the former finance minister, Setekbe, who examined the country's rising debt level and its potential challenges to the economy. Hi, and welcome to BizTech on Ghana Web TV, where we bring you business news that made headlines during the week, as well as an exclusive interview. I am Na Oyokwoti. Stay tuned. Ghana's economy, according to industry players, is doing pretty well, despite the fact that it has been badly hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. On BizTech today, we are here to speak to a former finance minister, Honorable Seth Tepe, to find out, from his perspective, whether or not these assertions are true. Thank you very much for joining me on BizTech today, Honorable. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, um, before I begin, I want to find out, on the issue of debt, would you say revenue and compensations are milking our economy as a country because of per the numerous borrowings we keep making? Well, they are not just milking. Um, if you are milking the cow, the, the milk is, is, is getting, getting finished. And let me explain. When, when you use your tax revenue, the entire tax revenue is not enough to pay interest and to pay uh, compensation, right? It means, one, you are borrowing to pay the balance of those two items. Then you are borrowing to pay the goods and services, which is what is used to keep government offices to school feeding and all those, run schools, hospitals, and the rest. Other than capital, we are not borrowing for that. And then we are borrowing for capital, the capital projects. Because remember, the tax revenue, if you take even total revenue, it's about 90-something. So it would have been exhausted. Then, West, uh, you are borrowing to pay past debt, which you borrowed. So this is how You are still in borrowing, borrowing. Yes. And so if you don't do anything to raise revenue or to reduce expenditure, this situation will continue. And for how long can we keep on borrowing? For example, for how long can we keep on borrowing to support free SHS? You see, the principle in fiscal management is that your recurrent expenditure, what you call recurrent expenditure, which is your wages, your interest, and your goods and services, should all be paid from your tax revenue. Okay. And then your repayment of debt should also be paid from your tax or total revenue. It's okay to borrow for capital projects. And that is just like households, it's like businesses. Right, it's okay to borrow to buy a car, it's okay to borrow to build a house, it's okay, or to save to build a house and to do those are big capital. Sometimes, even good to, 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 to borrow to pay school fees and others, as most of our parents have done. But the lesson is you learn to pay it down, you don't, you don't borrow and then throw it out 15 years for another government to pay. You don't, but you see, even if you throw it out for another government to pay the principal, you are paying the interest. This is the reason interest has become a headache. You see, you've thrown the principal out for somebody to pay. You've thrown. So this whole thing about uh, our nominal or our debt stock is lower than previous governments. Previous governments were paying their debt stock. They keep saying yes, it's lower than. But I'm saying, I'm saying that previous governments were paying that debt stock. Yes, some debt is carried over to fuel. But when you have a conscious program, to carry debt which you should have paid to future generations, you can comfortably say that the debt stock is lower. Okay. But you should add back the ones that you've thrown out. And let me be, let me be clear, we also did refinancing, right? And it's a strategy that you use, especially when you're under pressure. But when you do that, that is the main reason we also put the sinking fund in place. Mm -hmm. So that it will be paying the debt that you are throwing to future generations because you are sacrificing something today knowing very well that you have thrown the debt I have for future generations, right? So that you don't use your heritage fund as we wanted to do, to use, use your heritage fund to finance recurrent expenditure, 
Imagine if when that argument was on, you know, three, four years ago, you know, we had created a stabilization fund, a heritage fund, you know, to, to finance free SHS and the rest. Where would we have been when COVID struck? With the 250 million US dollars. That simply means that we could have been struggling to borrow 1.25 billion, not 1 billion, from the IMF for COVID. Right? So it means that we've done something good for ourselves. And if we had been putting money aside in the stabilization fund as it should be, as it should have been, maybe we would have paid 500, we would have used 500, 600 million of our own money in support of COVID. Right? And then you go and borrow less which is 600, but with three oil fields, we didn't, we didn't continue with this, all these structures. And it's not just for me, it's Piak and others are saying, you know, what we are saying. So we never put, you know, these things, you know, uh, or we didn't, or we didn't to the extent that we should, we should put them in place. And, and, and therefore, we lost the potential. But you see, it's only when you are able to cope with your crisis, it's only when you are able to cover your capital expenditure through borrowing and your recurrent expenditure through tax revenues, current tax revenue. You see, the reason we say they are recurrent is that they recur every year. It's not like capital where it takes two years or so to finish. But these ones, you pay my wages, next year you have to pay my wages. If you, you, have, you borrow, you have to pay the interest. So it means that you should also finance it from your recurrent income, your recurrent income. You see, so that when you have a bonanza like oil, then you use it to plan to tackle other things like that. But so if you had done that, and we have had to continue with this, is the only way you can win yourself off the island because it's less dependence, you know, on them and others giving you money. It's not saying you don't go to them, but it's saying you go to them when you have a crisis, like during the global financial crisis when Portugal, Spain, and others, you know, suffered so severely that they went to the IMF. But the good thing is that because their economies were sound, within two years they were out. They had wind themselves or the other, so they hesitated. And that's a situation that, you know, we should find ourselves, you know, uh, in. So winning yourself of the IMF through a solid homegrown policy, you see where the, where the ideas came from, you know, and through a, a solid homegrown policy or a solid beyond aid program, you know, which should begin, you know, with, you know, oil revenues and the rest. You, you, you can't say that you are winning yourself with the IMF. That's why we had to go quickly. And I hear people saying that you can't compare previous crises, you know, to, to COVID. Nobody is saying that COVID is not severe. But we are saying a couple of things. Like, remember that before COVID, everybody said the global financial crisis was the worst. Mm -hmm. It was the worst since the Great Depression. You know, so COVID has only, you know, increased the level of crisis that you may face. You know, and who measured, who measured the impact on the economy? Because we didn't reinforce those expenditures, those days, right? But was resolved from the budget. But who measured the effect? of cocoa trees that were bent, which took five years of replanting, you know, to, to enable us. Who measured the impact on foreign exchange? Who measured the impact on budget revenues? Who measured the impact on cocoa farmers, you know, and all that? Who needed to be supported? Right. So the, the, the my crisis is bigger than your crisis syndrome. It's not helpful. You know, it's not helpful. All governments should know that you cannot run for four years, a government for four years, continuously, sometimes not even two years, without facing one crisis or the other. As I said, it could be drought, it could be bushfires. Drought normally brings bushfires, and then lack of food. It could be dropping, you know, commodity prices, as you say, it could be anything. And the important thing is to prepare for the crisis, whether it's big or small. Um, on the issue of several borrowings and all that that we keep making as a nation, um, what do you propose as a former finance minister? What do you suggest could be the best option for us or the method we could adopt to avoid these several borrowings? Already you mentioned the uh, sinking funds and uh, all that. Yes. What other method do you think can be adopted? That's the principal method. The point is that, <laughs> look, if you, 
let, let me ask you as a worker, right? If you're hard up and you go to your bank, right? I take it that your main income is salary, unless you have maybe some, you know, cow or something in a farm, or you have, you know, some farm, or your parents have bequeathed you with some, you know. So let's, but let's take it simply that your main income is salary, right? You want to take your kid to, you know, I don't know whether you are to preparatory school because you're a young guy. I want my child to do better than I did. Maybe I went to a public school and all that, right? Yeah. You go to your bank. What do you tell the bank? Or what do the bank tell you? You will take part of your salary when it's paid upfront, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you don't agree and you don't pay, you can go back to the bank. So that is a household. Or take a business. You know, take Ghana Web. I use those examples. You have a, you know, a stand here, you have a camera here, you, have a, you are taking video shots and everything. So you buy this equipment. Most businesses don't buy this equipment for current income. They go for loans to buy. What do you do? You put a repayment mechanism in place. It's the only way you can go back and expand your business. Otherwise, the bank, you can't go to the bank. If you are not lucky, the bank will even come and confiscate your car, your, you know, your, your equipment and everything. It's the same thing with the nation. So, you know, I can't stop talking about, you know, the need for a sinking fund. It's in our constitution. The fact that we have not been implementing it doesn't make it unimportant. Anything in the constitution is important. And it's because those who looked over the economy before us went through a certain problem. You don't wait until you experience the thing before you learn from somebody's experience. It's in the Constitution. Contingency fund. It's in the Constitution. It's just that we had never populated the, con the contingency fund until we got oil and we sat and then we capped the stabilization fund and then we put the assets into sinking fund and stabilization fund. And the evidence is there showed. Right. So, um, Yes, we can use other mechanisms, like refinancing, right? If the burden is, and you want to ease the payment, it has become a huge burden you were not paying, fine. You, you refinance, refinancing means that you stretch it out, but you don't stretch it out and pay only interest, which is an old habit. The reason your principal became a burden for you and the interest on it is because you were not paying down the principal, right? So when you throw it out now, for future generations, right? Your generation should start by putting some money, you know, aside. And a good example is a zero coupon bond that we did recently. We took lesser money, we discounted it. And we say that the government that wins in 2025 should be the one that should pay the principal, right? With three oil fields. You see, we were at almost the same point, even West Point, because in 2014, we had won the election in 2013. 2014, we realized that the bond for 2007 was going to fall due in 2017. That's the 10 years. So from 2014, 15, 16, we put all the money aside to redeem 550 out of the 750, and we therefore we deferred only to 250. We paid a substantial part. That's why nobody heard about the bond, that the Kufo bond, if you like. Right? So let's learn from that. So let's not, when we pay Kufo bond, right, you don't come and you don't pay Mama bond, but you push it out. And then you, you expect the one after Nanado okay. to pay. Right? So the essence of the sinking fund is. You know, one government succeeds each other, and government starts development projects. You know, and therefore, that's the idea of what we call the pipeline. You know, which luckily, you know, is being seen now. So you don't discard investments and go and start new one. We don't discard you. So we need to just, you know, put things things in place. So you see, the answer, the short answer to your question is what has worked for the countries that are succeeding. Coming there. Yes, what has worked for the countries that are succeeding? We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to imitate what they have been doing to be successful. So we'll go for a breather here. When we come back, we'll continue with our conversation. Power 
powers and principalities. There's so much fire inside me. Tragedy struck when part of the largest hillside at the kosher rubbish dump collapsed. Welcome back from that break. Uh, we are still here on Best Tech and we are speaking to Honorable Ted Tepe, the former finance minister of Ghana during the NDC regime. Thank you very much once again, Honorable. Yeah, yes, and so um, Dr. Baumia said uh, in one of his episodes that uh, they've re uh, refinanced the economy and paid all the debts the NDC left in, in power before. The NDC left, actually. So um, how would you respond to such a comment? Did he say they refinance yes. or they pay? They paid. When you refinance, yes, you go and borrow and you pay, right? But you are using, it's a substitution. It's not a payment. I think, I think the, the problem has to understand that it's a substitution. So you go and borrow. So let me give you an example. As we were speaking, you know, uh, not applying to you, and I hope that you're willing to go and practice it. <laughs> Um, you go and take a loan to pay your child's school fees for this semester. You did not pay from bank A. Then you go to bank B, right? So you took, let's say 2,000, right? I think that should be reasonable for a good example to pay fees to buy school uniform and things for your, for your kid from bank A. During the period you should be paying, you didn't pay, right? You know you can't go to bank A. Mm -hmm. So you go to bank B, and you go and collect 2,000 from bank B, right? And then you take the 2,000 from bank B, and you go and settle your debt in bank A. Have you finished paying your debt? <laughs> <laughs> You're only substituting one borrowing with another. You know, so this is a simplistic you know, ways, you know, I, I didn't hear that particular comment, but this will be my explanation. They did refinance it. And that's why the debt didn't go down. That's why the rate of borrowing did not go down. And it's clear. If you were paying, if you had paid all of, you know, Muhammad's debt, yes, the debt they borrowed is higher than Muhammad's debt. But at least the debt ratio would have been around 60%. If they had paid. It be 50%. Oh, let's say from 57, we left around 57. Let's say, yeah, because if you say that you have paid, is it just the Mahama one? Because remember, they have, you know, the, the current administration has been saying that the death stock, so it's even a contradiction. Remember, they've been saying that the death stock that they are paying now came from other governments, includes what came from other governments, and that's for every government. So if you have paid the Mahama one, assuming you paid even the Mahama one, you know, for political effect. Did you pay the Kufo one? Yeah. Have you finished paying Buidam? Are we not dispersing on Buidam, the money that was used to set up Buidam? Because it was a 10 to 15 year you know, facility. So we could now be ending you know, its payment. By the way, I'll urge you to go and take the uh, debt, uh, public debt report and go to the appendix and you will see whether all the, you know, for 2020 and see whether all those debts have been paid. You see, we want to point people to the source researchers like you, you know, so the evidence is there, and then you can do a compliment, you know, of this interview, and say whether all those debts, you know, have been paid. It is like saying that, let me give you one good example you can, it's like saying that we finished paying the trouble. The CDV facility that was taken for a trouble, which we have not expanded, with three oil fields. It's been paid from the, from the oil, you know, so you can, you can pick those, you know, projects. You can go and see whether, you know, the Terminal 3 loan that was taken, you know, MPS loan and others. You, is there, go and check, you know, the appendix to the budget. You see, this is the transparency which led us to do the Public Financial Management Act, so that all this will be there, will become transparent and open, you know, for everybody to, to validate. 
Okay. Um, lastly, Honourable, uh, the new development bank uh, issue. Do you think we need a new development bank as a nation at the moment? We need a development bank at any time. And let me generalize it. We need a bank, as the minister explained and the president explained. We need a bank that will give long-term capital to the government itself and to businesses. And if the economy is such that it is so attractive for private, those who establish private banks, it's so attractive for those who establish private banks, right, to finance only, to buy treasury bills only and the rest, and the maximum to buy the government's three-year bond. And they don't want to buy, you know, 40-year bond. And a good example is the 40-year bond that we did. We, we didn't do it domestically. We went outside to do it. The refinancing that we did, the replacement or the substitution which I was talking about. Right. So we need a development bank. But the vision for a development bank, the question was in the name, the vision for a development bank. Remember I, earlier I spoke about the capital budget being referred to as development budget, capital budget, or investment budget. So what's the difference? Having explained this from the budget perspective, what's the difference between National Investment Bank and the development, National Development Bank. Right. So the vision was there already. The vision was there from the Nkrumah era. And NIB was established for the China Development Bank, which was established in 1992 or 1993. That vision was there long before the Chinese set up their bank. Right. If you want to build infrastructure and you cannot do a bond, a domestic bond, because infrastructure is deep money and it takes time. And especially if it is public infrastructure, even if you, if you did the, the dual carriage to Kumasi, right, and you tone it, it will take, because you have to be repairing it all the time to make it, you know, solid so that there's no complaint, it will take you minimum maybe 20 years, 20, 25 years. And this is why the World Bank became the institution, unlike the IMF that gave short-term money, became the institution that gave developing bank, sorry, developing countries the loan that they need to build their infrastructure, and then with 10 years more after room and 30 years to pay, 40 years. When you become a middle income country, and especially when you are producing oil, these sources cease. So you have to substitute it. Ben Kuma saw the dream even when he was getting that type of money for the Kosomoda, from the World Bank and others, US and other places. Right, so we need it. But the point is the duplication. You see, that's the point. And we also have the infrastructure. You know, some countries do the infrastructure so what you, through what you call sovereign wealth funds, like Dubai. And that's the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund, which had a seed capital of 250 million you know, US dollars, which we put in from the time we did a bond, the 2014 bond. It became controversial, right, if you remember. Because the infrastructure, Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund did not become operational by the end of 2016, that money was left. So what happened to that? Where's the commitment for infrastructure, for development, for investment? What happened to that money? We should have been speaking about that money as well, because that's also meant for, for infrastructure, for development, or for investment. So we have a combination of three things now. The Infrastructure Fund, the New Development Bank, Right, you know, infrastructure fund that was capitalized, 
250 million US dollars, which was invested plus the interest from 2014, should be, should be reasonable now, right? So it's not just a 1 billion or 700, 500 million, I see different you know, figures. But we also have those money. So let's, let's take those together. We said we have recapitalized National Investment Bank. So let's put all of those together and have you know, an, an agenda for development. It's in the interest of the country. It's not in the name. So it's a commitment should have been shown with the Infrastructure Investment Fund. It could have been shown you know, with the National Investment Bank. Right. Uh, finally, finally, on, on, on the scale of 100%, how do you rate our economy now? Oh, I don't have to rate it. I don't have to rate it. You see, because I'm conscious of the fact that I have occupied a political office, right? And I've been Minister for Finance. So all, my only answer to that is, let's listen to IMF. They are saying the numbers that we say we are showing, right? They so give the, the total picture. And I've listened to some of the responses. We, we can do another, you know, for, to discuss the responses. Let's listen to Fitch. Let's listen to Moody's. Let's listen to the World Bank. All these institutions couldn't be wrong, and all of them couldn't hate Ghana by telling us, watch your debt, watch your deficits, watch your spending. You see, they have expertise. Some of these institutions have a whip with which they, if they give you money, they have a whip with which they bring you in alignment, and therefore they are unpopular for that. But they also have deep expertise. We rely on them for advice. We rely on the World Bank for advice how to use the oil because the World Bank is operating in other oil producing countries and they have been there long before we discovered our oil. Right? So I would urge, you know, or if you are fed up with those institutions, what about EIU? EU, EIU, yes. The private ones. So I would say that in terms of rating the economy as good or bad, it may be good, it may be bad from different perspectives, right? But, you know, because if you pick a particular aspect of it, you can't have an economy where everything is, is bad. You know, yes, perfect. Neither would you have it where everything is, is also bad. You know, but when you are tilting towards the bad, then you have to listen to the voices who are analyzing and sitting back and, and they are best at comparing you to other countries. And, and then we listen to them, what they are saying about the economy. So thank you very much, Honorable, much for being on Bistec today. Uh, this is where we wrap up today's interview on Bistec. And I've been speaking to the Honorable Seth Tekbe, the former finance minister for Ghana during the NDC regime. Make a date with us next time on Bistec. My name is Imos Eko Kofi. That was an insightful interview with the former finance minister, Seth Tekbe. Now we move straight to the biz headlines. Minister of State's designate at the Finance Ministry has disclosed the government of Ghana is planning to raise one billion U.S. dollars through the sale of sustainable bonds in July this year. According to Charles Edubwahin, proceeds from the sale will go up towards financing domestic debt, which will be used for environmental and social projects, as well as loans taken to fund government's free senior high school program. With this issue. We are looking at refinancing those debts already raised to undertake projects in the environmental and social sectors. Out of all that, we will raise with our capital markets Monday this year only 1.5 billion US dollars in fresh debt. The rest is for refinancing our payback, Edu Boahin is quoted to have said. Now on our next news headline, the government of Ghana has set aside an amount of 1.9 billion Ghana cities to allow road constructors undertake asphalt overlays, the roads and highways minister had said. According to Kwesi Amwako Atta, the works will commence from this year to 2024 and will cover 
1,500 kilometers of asphalt overlays in major towns and cities, addressing journalists during the minister's press briefing on Sunday, May 23. The roads minister revealed Ghana has a road network spanning 78,000 kilometers with only 23 percent paved. Now on the African free trade area, Wamkele Meni, Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat, has said his outfit has established a court that will serve as a dispute resolution forum. The move, according to Wamkele, is hinged on inspiring confidence among traders, offer clarity and certainty of trade deals as they use the platform. Addressing participants at the Africa Trade Roundtable discussion organized by the University of Professional Studies in Accra, the Secretary General explained that this settlement body will function as a full court with right mechanisms and structures in place. Now on investment, the Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, Yofi Grant, has stated that the hesitant attitude of Ghanaians when it comes to the payment of taxes is hindering government's infrastructure and development drive. According to him, the construction of roads, schools, hospitals and other development projects can only come to fruition, to fruition if Ghanaians commit to paying their taxes. Now, because we are not able to collect taxes as government, this also leads to, leads to an inadequate revenue generation for most long-term development projects, as well as even the short-term um, development projects. And that hinders our, our economic growth and impedes our structural goals economically and infrastructurally. And though we need roads, we need bridges, we need railways, we need homes, it's difficult for government to engage in all those things. And there comes in the partnership with private sector. But of course, the private sector is indeed the universe from which government collects its taxes. So it's very important that we should sit down, that's government and private sector, to engage, to see how we can optimally improve the tax regime, but also ensure that private sector is convinced and comfortable with the fact that we all have to pay taxes. A casual look at the tax regime. Now, still, still on the Ghana investment promotion sector, the Chief Executive Officer of the sector, Yofi Grant, has said in as much as Ghana's economy was badly hit with the coronavirus pandemic, it remains attractive to foreign investors. According to him, Ghana was able to secure an amount of 2.65 billion US dollars as revenue from foreign direct investments in 2020. With all the tax amendments and the exemptions that have been put in place, especially during this era of global difficulty, Ghana has increased investor confidence in the business environment. And I'm pleased to say that in 2020, um, total FDI into Ghana was in the region of 2.65 billion. It was the third largest in Africa after Egypt with 5.5 billion and Nigeria with 2.66 billion. Um, now, this is very commendable because we all understand what happened during the pandemic where most nations started looking inwards. And the, U, um, the UNDP and UNCTAD predicted that global foreign direct investment flows would shrink by some 42%. And of course, Africa would have been the, the worst hit in that regard. So it's, it's interesting and commendable that despite all these uh, vagaries of the pandemic, Ghana was still able to maintain attractiveness.
On the back of allegations that the Ghana Water Company cut supply to the Tema oil refinery because of the inability to pay an accumulated debt of 4 million Ghana City, Tor has refuted the claims. According to the management of the refinery, Tor is not on the verge of shutdown as circulated on social media, adding that the company is at the moment taking strategic measures to ensure that the oil refinery bounces back to be more effective and efficient. Tor, in a statement cited by Ghana Web, stated that several potential investors and partners have in recent times expressed their interest in either partnering Tor or providing funds for the revitalization and expansion of the refinery. The statement said, we wish to refute what has recently been circulated in the media to suggest that Tor is on the verge of shutdown. Such publications from anonymous sources create an unwarranted negative impression of the organization and hinder the progress of revitalization revitalization and expansion plans as well as the business operations at large. In the world of spare parts dealers, the dealers at Abosokai in Ghana have welcomed the decision by the government to relocate the spare parts hub to the outskirts of the country's capital. The dealer said they had wished for this relocation, but time was not due and so are happy the government has now seen the need to relocate them. Plans are underway for the relocation of all spare parts dealers from Abosokain in Accra to Afienya. According to the new Greater Accra Regional Di Minister Henry Quarty, who has initiated a campaign to make Accra work again, the government has identified a land in Afienya, Afienya and was working towards allocating it to the spare parts dealers. That's all we have for you for this week's edition of Bistec on Ghana Web TV. But log on to www.ghanaweb.com for more news stories. Get interactive with us on all our social media handles. We are at the Ghana Web on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel, Ghana Web TV. Thanks for staying with us. I am Na Oyokote. Have a great weekend.